The police shooting of four young African-American athletes on the New Jersey Turnpike in the spring of 1998 put a national spotlight on racism and racist profiling by New Jersey state troopers, what among the troopers themselves are reported to call driving while black. While 13% of drivers on the turnpike are African-American, 46% of those pulled over are from the black community. Fortunately, none of the athletes was killed, but the injuries brought a tragic end to their athletic careers, which friends said had Olympic potential. It also sheds light on another incident a quarter century ago. A car was stopped. Its occupants were held at gunpoint with their hands over their heads. Shots rang out. One, Asada Shakur, was shot in the back with her hands raised. Another, Zaid Shakur, was shot and killed. A third, Sundiata Akoli, was also injured, as was one of the troopers who died from his wounds. Asada and Sundiata were sentenced to life plus sentences. After a trial marked by racism and a major cover-up, that the most likely reason the trooper was downed was by friendly fire from the other trooper. Asada escaped six years later and is living in exile in Cuba. Sundiata remains in prison to this day. Recently, New Jersey Governor Whitman has offered a hundred thousand dollar reward for Asada's capture and the New Jersey troopers even wrote the Pope asking him to request Asada's extradition during his recent trip to Cuba, compounding the cover-up. All three were leaders of the Black Panther Party. All three were victims of the racist COINTELPRO, the so-called counterintelligence program of the FBI and the big city police departments that has been implicated in the jailings and murders of so many uh, black and Latin leaders of those times. COINTELPRO's attacks were directed at any organization that gave a voice to the concerns of the black and Latin communities, no matter how moderate or militant, which took on a national character. We join Asada at the World Youth Festival in Havana in August of 1997, where she has been living in exile for many years. A friend and inspiration in the struggle, Asada Shakur. for your very kind words. Um, for those of you who do not know anything about me, um, my name is Asada Shakur. Um, I was and still am a political activist. I started my political activity during the 1960s. I started in working with community organi organizations. Uh, I started also uh, when I went to study at Manhattan Community College. I became involved almost immediately in the politics of uh, the student struggle. I also became involved in uh, struggling to end the United States government invasion and uh, hostilities against the people of Vietnam. And then I joined the Black Panther Party. I did not know it at the time, but the Black Panther Party uh, was the number one organization that was targeted by uh, the FBI and by the COINTEL program. For those of you who do not know what COINTELPRO means, it, is, it was a counterintelligence program designed to uh, neutralize, destroy any serious political opposition to the policies of the United States government. Uh, what they did was to uh, try to divide and conquer, to uh, set organization against organization, uh, to um, try to do everything 
possible to uh, just attack the credibility and the integrity of activists and leaders, and that meant uh, accusing them of all kinds of crimes. Uh, it meant uh, suggesting that they were agents of the police, accused of leaving um, pieces of paper around, uh, false documents to uh, snitch jacket people, which made them, uh, people suspect them, and which created uh, a lot of confusion. They attacked people on all kinds of levels. Um, I was one of the people who was targeted uh, by COINTELPRO, but there were many, many others. Um, as a member of the Black Panther Party in New York City, I witnessed 21 of our most effective, most articulate organizers and leaders uh, be victimized by uh, a conspiracy charge. They were charged with conspiracy, and the charges were insane. They were charged with conspiracy to blow up department stores. They were charged with conspiracy uh, to uh, blow up subways. And one of the most insane charges was uh, conspiracy to blow up the Bronx Botanical Gardens, and nobody could ever figure out, you know, <laughs> why anybody would want to blow up flowers. That certainly was not part of our political program and platform. Um, but however, they were put into prison for, most of them spent uh, two years, more than two years in prison. Each was given a hundred thousand dollar bail. And what that did was to limit our uh, effectiveness in organizing in our communities and make us have to spend a lot of our time, energy, and resources liberating our comrades instead of being able to effectively organize in our communities. I believe personally that COINTELPRO is still going on under another name and a more, much more sophisticated, much more dangerous type of COINTELPRO. So we can never think that that was an era that was in history. The United States government has not changed. In fact, I think it, uh, it has become more repressive. The number of people in prison, I think, backs me up. The number of people that are killed by police backs me up. The number of uh, names on computers backs me up. And the fact that Jesse Helms is in uh, on the Senate floor talking about arresting people for coming to a youth festival <laughs> backs me up. So I think that uh, as time goes on, uh, it's more and more obvious that repression is one of the most uh, frequent tools used by the United States government to smash anybody who is fighting for real uh, justice, for real liberty, and for real freedom in the United States. In my case, uh, I was targeted, as, as I said before, by COINTELPRO, and uh, I was forced uh, to go underground. I was forced to disappear. Uh, the police uh, knocked down my door, took everything. I mean, they took my posters, my books, my records, uh, my underwear. And I, you know, I don't know what they were looking for in my underwear, but they took everything, it's so-called evidence, and they tried to accuse me of aiding and abetting harboring fugitives. Um, I decided uh, that there were two choices. Either I could talk to the FBI and cooperate with the uh, FBI, or I could disappear. Uh, at that time, I considered cooperating with the FBI an unprincipled 
uh, act because I thought, and I still think that the FBI is a, is not a tool to uh, protect people. It is a instrument of repression, and uh, specifically, an uh, instrument uh, of repression that targets people of color, oppressed people, and specifically African people who are oppressed in the United States. So I thought that uh, cooperating would be immoral, and I decided to disappear. I decided uh, to go underground, and at the time, I was very innocent. I, I thought, well, you know, uh, all they're looking for me, me for is aiding and abating, harboring fugitives. It was a lie. Uh, they never uh, continued uh, that charge. They never made that uh, charge formal. But I, th I thought, well, like, you know, this is going to roll over. This, will, this is a passing moment. But I was very mistaken. What happened was that uh, the FBI and the New York City Police uh, Department, their Red Squad, began to systematically feed news stories to the Daily News, to all of the New York City and national newspapers, creating this image of this woman that is this terrible person, that is this criminal, that is this murderer, that is this bank robber, that is uh, this terrorist. And what they did was they uh, took a photograph of a woman robbing a bank. They put my name under it, wanted, and they put that picture everywhere, in every bank, on the side of buses, on big uh, posters like this, on the subway, everywhere. And what they were doing was creating the condition where any cop in the United States could shoot me down. Had a license, had, you know, just I was like dead meat. And they came out and said, you know, if we see her, we will kill her. And it wasn't just me. They did the same thing to many other people. And some of those other people are still in prison. In May uh, 2nd, 1973, I was shot once with my hands in the air, shot once in the back. Uh, I was left on the ground and uh, to die. And they kept coming back and saying, is she dead yet? Is she dead yet? Finally, when it was obvious that I was not going to die right then, uh, I was taken to a hospital uh, where I was chained uh, to a bed. I was beaten, tortured, uh, kept incommunicado for four or five days. It seemed like a hundred. And uh, I was denied any right to see lawyers, to see anybody. My aunt, Evelyn Williams, who is also my lawyer, um, finally got a court order to come to see me. And um, since I could not tell her the extent of what was happening, I told her, please do something because uh, I was accused of killing a New Jersey state trooper and New Jersey state troopers were quote unquote guarding me and guarding me consisted at that time of sticking things into my wounds, of putting powder in my eyes that blinded me and saying that if I did not tell them what uh, they wanted to know, uh, I would never see again and some other things that I've just never talked about. Um, and I don't really want to get into that now because it will make me remember too vividly uh, that period. But anyway, based on demonstrations outside of the hospital, um, I was um, 
um, transferred to another hospital and the uh, New Jersey State troopers were replaced by some other guards. They weren't much better, but at least uh, they did not uh, attack me physically. Um, I uh, altogether uh, spent six and a half years in prison. Uh, I was accused of many things. I was acquitted on all charges except for the New Jersey uh, charge which, where I was accused of uh, aiding and abetting uh, in the murder of a New Jersey state trooper. Uh, I was tried by an all-white jury in a county where more than 70% of the people based on a, a jury project study were already prejudiced uh, and thought I was guilty. Um, it was a legal lynching and I'm actually ashamed of even participating in that. I should have just stayed in the cell and said, y'all do whatever you want because it wasn't a trial. It was a lynching. Uh, I was sentenced to life plus 30 years plus 30 days. Um, I um, spent more than two and a half years in solitary confinement in men's prisons. Uh, and in 1979, with the help of many people, many of my comrades, I was able to escape from prison and there was no other possible alternative. Uh, there was no such thing as an appeal. My aunt was very frustrated. Uh, she was doing the appeal and parts of the transcript disappeared, uh, the evidence disappeared, and so there was no such thing, no such possibility of ever uh, receiving justice in the courts of the United States. I still believe that there is no justice in the United States, and I still believe that more and more uh, the court system and the criminal justice system is a criminal system and will serve as a conveyor belt for poor people, for African people, for Latino people, for all oppressed people. Um, I don't want this really to be a, a run-on sentence. I would like to have more of a dialogue, if that's cool with everybody. Is that cool with everybody? And so, um, I've said a little bit about myself. I don't want to do a, a speech and tell you what you're already aware of, so I'd rather really address myself to talking about things that you're interested in, whether it has to do with me, whether it has to do with Cuba, whether it has to do with our struggle, or whatever you'd like to ask about. Let's limit the amount of speeching and do more questioning. Are we agreed? Okay. Monica? Um, Sarah, what, what are your feelings on the uh, impact of Geronimo Pratt being released from prison after 27 years, uh, you know, incarcerated? What type of impact do you think that this, you know, release will have on the struggle against racism and repression inside the United States? Well, I believe that uh, Geronimo is a amazingly strong human being who has suffered, I mean, in an unspeakable way. I mean, nine years in solitary confinement. I mean, Geronimo has withstood things that, you know, I mean, it's amazing that a human being can withstand. And he has left the, that prison after 27 years with his head held high and being committed to the liberation of African people and all oppressed people. And so I think that his uh, presence, his words, uh, his experiences are of infinite value to people who are interested in making, uh, uh, building social justice uh, in the United States. Um, 
I think that his uh, release is a definite victory for all people. Um, but I, you know, I, when I think about it, uh, even though I am clear that uh, his uh, release is a victory. I mean, they knew for, I mean, years and years and years that he was framed. It was obvious everybody from 60 Minutes to whoever talked about how he was framed by the FBI. I mean, and they talked about it 10 years ago. So the fact that he remained in prison for 27 years still filled me with just absolute rage and, in, you know, indignation. Um, but I think that uh, that is the price that one pays when one becomes an example of resistance. Anybody who becomes an example of resistance to the vicious, uh, system that exists in the United States must expect to be uh, targeted. I, um, during slavery, they cut off the heads of slaves and they put them on lap posts. Uh, and today, uh, even though it is totally obvious that um, People are innocent, were victimized by COINTELPRO, even though they talked about the Freedom of Information Act and they said, yeah, we, we did it. You know, we, we, we targeted people, we tried to destroy people, but they have never once admitted to and said, we tried to uh, uh, put Sun Diata in prison for, I mean, every every minute of his political activism. They never said, we, we're trying to kill Mumia. They never, I mean, it has been a, a, a meaningless freedom of information because really what they give you is a million pieces of paper with all the lines blacked out. So what kind of freedom of information is that? You know, I think that it is important, uh, the, the case of Geronimo, because I think right now we should start to demand that all of those political activists, activists who were victimized by COINTELPRO receive immediate amnesty. How can you have... How can you have a COINTEL program with no victim? You know, it's an insult to us as a people. So I think that Geronimo will be very instrumental in calling for that amnesty. And I think that uh, everybody should support him and other people who are struggling to liberate political prisoners and prisoners of war. Chris? For those of us who don't have a copy of your book personally, um, is it still in print in the U.S.? And if so, where is it available? Any ideas? I hope so. Now, I haven't been to the United States in a long time. So I don't even know what bookstores exist or not, but evidently people are still buying it. Um, uh, Does anybody know? are using it so that you will have to talk among yourselves. Um, <coughs> you know, in terms of where you can buy it. Um, and I'm also uh, in the future planning, not in the near future, planning to come out with another book. I will not name the book. I will not name the publisher because I do not want them to be immediately attacked by uh, the FBI or the CIA, etc. The last time, uh, with the first book, the state of Jersey tried to pass a law specifically against my book. And the law was so reactionary and so right wing that the, the Times wrote an article about it. You know, people denounced it. And so that they, uh, I think the governor ended up refusing to sign it. So um, I'm, you can expect uh, at some very near date in the future another book uh, to come out.
I heard the book was about racism. Uh, the book deals with a whole variety of issues. It talks about racism, it talks about um, my experiences in Cuba, it talks about uh, basically what I think it's a talking head book. Uh, it started from you know a series of interviews that, that I gave uh, and talks with groups. And uh, then it, it just started to expand and expand and expand. Uh, and people uh, sent questions from you know different activists in the movement sent questions uh, to me to answer. And um, then there came a schizophrenic part of the book where I started to ask myself questions and answer them. So that it, the book is a, 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 a mixture of all of those. Uh, Thanks. Um, where do you, uh, where do you take the, uh, in your opinion, where do you think the movement should be heading in the United States, where do you think it should be heading? And the second part of it is how do you contain your ties to that movement? Well, <laughs> that's a big question, but um, I think that one of the things, uh, oh, one of the places that the movement should be heading is to a creative way of reaching people. Um, I think one of the, the limitations of our organizing uh, style in uh, 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s was um, being very, uh, having a very uh, kind of uh, dogmatic, sectarian, um, I think that um, too often we did not look for new creative ways of <coughs> talking to people, of making people aware of what were, was happening in the world, uh, organizing people, and we relied on, you know, passing leaflets, and uh, a lot of times we talked at people instead of really communicating with people. And I think that one of the most important things now is to use the many tools that we have, uh, like uh, video, like computers, the internet. Uh, there's so many creative things that we can do to um, reach people that I, I don't think we have to rely on those kind of static, narrow uh, visions of reaching people and organizing people. I think that's one place the movement has to go. I think the other thing is to humanize our struggle. I, you know, I, um, I've met people that I work with, like during the 60s and organizations and we work together every day. And like, you know, 20, 30 years later, we meet in Cuba and we realize that we work together side by side every day. And we didn't know each other. We didn't know, you know, each other's families. We didn't ever spend time together. We never went on picnics together. We never did, you know, anything human together. All we did is, is you know, come to a meeting and say, all right, did you do your document? Uh, no, you didn't do it. We didn't ask why someone couldn't get something done. We didn't ask what was happening with someone inside, whether, you know, their mothers were sick, you know, etc. We sometimes ignore the presence of children, you know, instead of uh, making them part of what was happening and, and providing a space and activity for them. We often just, uh, would you please quiet those kids down right back there, we're having a meeting. And so I think that that kind of uh, way of making social change has to change in order for us to effectively um, change this world, we're going to have to change ourselves. We're going to have to change how we relate to each other as human beings. And I think that part of that is uh, creating a hum humanistic style of interchanging, uh, of 
really being concerned about other people who are struggling with us. I think another part of that is creating a, a sense of community. In the United States, what exists right now is total alienation. People are alienated from each other to the point where people are afraid to have eye contact with other people, afraid to smile at people, afraid to say good morning, good afternoon, how you doing? That is hell. <laughs> you know, when you are on a planet and you cannot relate to the other people who live next to you, who live upstairs, who live downstairs, then you have no community. And if you have no community, how do you organize a community that does not exist? <laughs> how do you work in a community that does not exist? So a lot of us are going to have to go back to block to block, door to door, people to people, how you doing, ways of organizing, and not just organizing the masses, the faceless, <laughs> masses, but organizing human beings and learning from those human beings because we have a lot to learn, you know. <laughs> Even those of us who have worked in, in uh, political struggles for 10, 20, 30 years, we can learn a lot from people, we can interchange, share, and so I think that one of our primary tasks is building a sense of community in our organizations, in our neighborhoods, uh, so that we can start to uh, liberate those communities and eventually start to uh, be in a position to make profound revolutionary changes in the United States.
doesn't always um, put out the truth, and that's what our work does by going out into the community. For instance, working on the welfare reform issues, the welfare departments. Um, I, I agree with uh, you, and I think that you know one of the things that we uh, have been socialized to believe is that we're going to see what we do on the 6 o'clock news. <laughs> you know, uh, there has been essentially a news blackout since 1970 in terms of political activity that is against uh, the policies of the United States. Um, you know, you can have 10,000 people show up and it will not be a story. Now you can have a dog with three ears, and that is, is, is new. So that um, I think that uh, what is important for us as a movement to, to realize is that there's a whole lot happening all over, and that people uh, are working where they are, they're acting locally, and a lot of them are thinking globally, but that the repression in the United States makes it very difficult to have national organizations. And so part of our work has to be informing each other of what is going on and really fighting against the very false concept that nothing's going on, no opposition to the policies of the United States, because I believe that that is a lie. I see people and I see things all from all over of people really doing things, protesting, working around political prisoners, working around police brutality, working to change the fundamental uh, situation in the United States. And then I meet somebody else from somewhere else in the country and they don't know that the people over here are doing something and the people over there don't, are doing something. So we have to find ways of communicating and letting each other know what we're doing and start coordinating more and more of our activities with the understanding that a national organization is very difficult and uh, we have to build the local organizations so that we are strong enough not to be smashed on, 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 on the national level. Uh, would you discuss your perceptions of race relations within Cuba as well as um, any political activities you've been involved in while here? Um, I think that um, when I came to Cuba, you know, I was like, all right, what's happening with the race question? That was number one, and I, you know, I looked at everything, and I, I tried to uh, really understand what was happening in Cuba, and uh, the first thing I learned was that I had to learn about the history of Cuba, Cuba's development, etc., and I could not transfer the experiences from the United States to Cuba, that there were two separate experiences, two separate histories. The second thing I, uh, I learned just from dealing with the relationships that people had with each other, it was not that hostile, girl, you know, division that exists in the United States. You know, people interact with each other on a much more uh, natural way, uh, a much more uh, fraternal, uh, sisterly, brotherly-like way. Um, that does not mean that this is fairyland. Uh, the first uh, lesson I learned here that revolution is a process. That change, social change, building social change, justice, and building socialism is a process. I would love it if it were a magic wand, but that magic wand just does not exist. So that uh, there are still people in Cuba who uh, have racist ideas, there's still people in Cuba that have sexist ideas, there's still people in Cuba that have classist ideas, that want to be millionaires. I mean, this is not fairyland, but those people are not in power. They do not have the power. <laughs> to determine the political, economic, priorities of 
this country, contrary to the United States. Uh, so I think that Cuba has come a long way. I think that Cuba is a revolution that is seriously committed to eliminating racism on all levels, not only in Cuba, but all over the world. And I think that in Angola, when it came to fighting racist uh, South Africa, people gave their lives here. And I think that it's not enough just to talk about eliminating racism. It's about uh, really putting your um, life, your heart, your soul where your mouth is. And so I think that the Cuban people have more than shown that they are committed to uh, eliminating racism. And a lot of people want to talk about racism outside of the context of social systems. As long as imperialism exists, you will have racism. As long as the United States has a monopoly on the movies, the TV shows, etc., you have a situation where they're exporting racism, exporting Eurocentric uh, and a Eurocentric uh, vision of the world, exporting an idea where you know middle class or rich white people are the center of the universe, and everybody else is an insignificant other. So I think that uh, Cuba has. Uh, pointed out uh, specifically to the world the need for the barefoot people to come together, the need for people of color all over to form countercultures, to form counter-information, to form another way of living that is not dependent on cultural imperialism or imperialism. Uh, uh, you have, there's a second part to your question. Your activity. Your okay. Um, well, uh, when I came here, I, um, one of the first things that I, I thought I needed to do was to write a book. Um, I didn't want to write it in, in one real sense. I, you know, because it was painful. I didn't want to look at prison, I didn't want to deal with the trials. It was, I mean, that was hard to write, but I felt that I needed to just get that out of my system, or it would just gnaw at my inside, so I did that. Another thing that was very important to me uh, when I came here to do was to bond and unite with my daughter. She was born when I was in prison, uh, and we had never had a chance to be together, to be mother and daughter. And so um, Cuba was a place where, that was a, where we were able to do that. And that was a beautiful experience, a hard experience, a painful experience, but we were able to Bond. We were able to come together as a family, as mother and daughter, and I am a very proud mother and grandmother. <laughs> and I think that my family, in spite of all the things that, that, that we have suffered, uh, my mother, you know, she had a heart attack uh, right after I escaped because uh, the police just hassled her and you know kept banging on her door and demanding that she let uh, them search uh, her house and invading her work. Uh, my aunt uh, has gone through hell, uh, spent 10 days in jail and you know, years uh, struggling uh, for my liberation, but all of our struggle has brought us more, has brought us together closer as a family and has let us appreciate the continuity of 
our struggle and let us appreciate the importance of families coming together and healing because I think that wherever you have people who suffer oppression, you have wounded people. Because every day when you are African, when you are Latino in the United States, you get slapped, slapped, and slapped. You, you get insulted on a daily basis. You can either ignore it, and sometimes you have to ignore it because you can't uh, fight against every time someone follows you around in the store. You can't go off every time someone uh, acts like you're stupid or retarded or, you know, uh, ignorant. Uh, you can't react to them. So what you do is, you, you, it boils inside one. And so I think that uh, sometimes in our family relationships, we take things out against each other, we, uh, we suffer silently. Children come home and when their parents ask them how was your day, they don't have the words to express that the teacher dissed them, and, you know, that day and has been dissing them every day for the past I don't know how long. So I think that one of the things that people who are pressed have to be consciously aware of is that we have to heal. We have to heal on a personal level. We have to heal on a family level. We have to heal on a community level. And I believe that we have to heal on a spiritual level. I think that it is very important uh, for us to do that. And I think that one of the things that I have been able to do here in Cuba is to work on healing. Uh, I, you know, in the United States, you just live in a, a constant tension. You walk down the street holding your pocketbook like this. Uh, you know, you. Uh, this is the first time I've ever lived at a society, in a society that is at peace. So I think that part of um, liberation for oppressed people is a, a healing process. And another thing I've done here, I uh, studied, I studied here for some years. I studied social science and got a master's degree in that. Now I'm writing another uh, finishing another book. Um, so I try to keep active and I also try to, to tell people, uh, not only Cubans, but people in the international community here about the realities that exist in the United States, about the human rights violations. I talk about political prisoners. I talk about uh, Mumia Abu Jamal. I talk about just, you know, the reality of life in the United States instead of the fantasy that many people receive via uh, the movies, you know, because people really have a movie Disneyland vision of life in the United States. So I try to tell them, you know, that that has nothing to do with uh, the reality. Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse might be in the White House or wherever, but they are not on the streets of the United States. What I could probably add <coughs> that uh, Asada might not say is that she's a very, very powerful symbol and a source of inspiration. She's a link between the reality here and the struggle in the United States. I'm sure hundreds of people who have traveled here from the United States have visited with her have been better informed about the U.S. through visits with her than through their own analysis in the United States. Uh, she's like an invaluable resource in our struggle and continues to, to contribute to that even from this distance. And one of the things I think we can hope will happen because of the exposure people in this uh, festival has, have had with her is that it means uh, you will be a bridge from her to all those communities that you represent to share with them the beauty, the sense of struggle, the clarity about the issues uh, and the vision for, for like that new society that all of us are working for. So she's a, she's a treasure. So she going into the 
great detail or implicating people unnecessarily. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the help that you did receive in your liberation, because I know that many of us, um, if we have read your book, or, if, or even if we have read your book, there's an image of like this Shawshank Redemption kind of escape thing that doesn't include any of the people that may that are serving time in the United States for helping you or are living in exile for helping you. And I think that those people certainly deserve our support as well. And we need to know who they are. Let me say this. She can have it. Just be quiet. I cannot thank uh, the people who helped me enough. All kinds of people uh, in communities all over, people who said, sister, he, you know, stay here tonight, sister, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, you have a coat, uh, you know, uh, get your coat, you need, you know what I mean, there, that solidarity I have experienced all through my political act. Uh, life, whether it was as an activist, whether it was underground, uh, whether it was in prison. When I was in prison, people came or uh, whenever they were allowed to come. And many times, you know, they cut off my visits uh, and limited my visits severely. People came to see me. Uh, I had defense committees. Uh, for me, for Sufiata, a Foley, uh, for uh, in not only the United States but in other countries as well, people supported us. Um, when I was uh, able to escape, many people participated in that uh, escape. But I, I will be frank; uh, I do not talk about. Uh, the people who helped me. I do not talk about the people who uh, helped me either in, I do not talk about the escape, I do not talk about my period underground. Altogether I spent seven or eight years in underground. underground and uh, I would never put anybody's life or liberty in justice, I mean in, in, in jeopardy because there is no justice and because the United States government is vicious. I mean, totally vicious. And so, um, you know, there's some things that are just not meant to be spoken about and that is something that is not just meant to be spoken about now. But I must say that there are people in prison uh, who were accused and, a vic and convicted of my liberation, uh, Mutulu Shakur, Sekou Odinga, Sylvia Baraldini, uh, Marilyn Buck, uh, and I must say that uh, they should be uh, liberated immediately. Uh, um, They were tried under, uh, I don't know if you know RICO, the RICO law, if anybody, uh, RICO in Spanish means rich. <laughs> the RICO law was designed to be used against the mafia, organized crime, but the reality of RICO that it was used against people in liberation movements often and under RICO, you can put somebody in, in prison, try them, and convict them on, in, with evidence that is this substantial. The RICO law and, uh, is just uh, a way, was used as a way of by inference, by association, et cetera, establishing a, a situation where people could be easily railroaded into prison. And I will also want to say 
that in the case specifically of Sekou Odinga, he is one of the most, his case is one of the most flagrant cases of torture that has ever uh, uh, come to the light. Because a lot of, I mean, his case, the, the torture of Sekou Odinga, not only was his head pushed in, in toilet bowls and, and he was, you know, tried to drown. I mean, I mean they put cigarettes out on all over his body. Uh, they beat him until he had to get his spleen removed. I mean, that was, you know, a flagrant uh, violation of any kind of human rights, civil rights. I mean, that was the most vicious act. And nobody, very few people in the United States have published the reality uh, of that case, have talked about that case, and it really should be one of the, the cases that should be um, broadcast from coast to coast because it is amazing how, that no major newspaper, uh, magazine, etc., has told the truth about what happened to people like say who Odinga, because he wasn't the only one that was tortured. He was not. But I think that it's important to expose what happened in that case and to also talk about how many people's houses were knocked down, uh, so-called looking for me, how many people's phones were bugged, with a court order because what the United States government did is they used that escape to try to uh, uh, accelerate the uh, repression in our communities and when people responded and they responded beautifully and they responded with dignity and many people put uh, uh, posters up in their house saying Asada Shakur is welcome here and I thank all of those people <laughs> for doing that. Um, can you just speak about some of your emotional feelings towards the United States knowing that there is still a struggle and there are still your family there? And somebody, uh, speak, to, uh, speak about some of your emotional feelings towards the United States knowing that there's still a struggle and knowing that part of your family is still there? and that you're here in Cuba. And how does that play within you? Um, you yeah. You haven't heard some of what you said. <laughs> um, well, let me say this. You know, from Cuba, uh, I look at the United States, and I mean, things have gotten worse, much worse since I was in the United States. Uh, when I was in the United States, there were not three million to five million homeless people. There were not, you know, um, the whole crack ep ep epidemic uh, did not exist. Um, I, uh, escaped from prison in 1979 and since that time the population of women in prison has tripled. Uh, today one-third of young black men between the ages of 18 and 30 are in prison or under the, the uh, jurisdiction of the so-called criminal justice system. You know, uh, when I left, uh, Jesse Helms and uh, Strong Thurman were in the state house waving the co uh, Confederate flag. Today, they're in the Senate. And one is the head of the Foreign Relations Committee, and the other is the head of the Armed uh, Services Committee. So uh, you have a, a situation where uh, racism is more acute in the United States than 
it has ever been. Uh, you have a situation where um, you have a situation where um, there are all these code words. Uh, you know, that mean die to people of color. Whether they're talking about eliminating affirmative action, whether they're talking about uh, 187, uh, uh, or just uh, throwing uh, immigrants, illegal immigrants, or legal immigrants out of the country or, pre or preventing uh, people to immigrants. They are talking about uh, cutting all kinds of welfare. Uh, they are, in fact, cutting uh, money for education, for health care. Uh, you have a, a government right now that is telling uh, poor people Die. You know, I mean, affirmative action, they're talking about uh, they want to cut affirmative action and everybody knows that affirmative action in the first place has never been very affirmative and it's never been very accurate. But at the same time, you know, they're talking about uh, they want to be a colorblind society. Now how can you ex uh, it, uh, it oppress, exploit uh, people, subject them to Jim Crow laws, ex uh, subject them to slavery, etc. And then when they start talking about measures to get rid of all of that historical baggage, then you want to be colorblind? You weren't colorblind all that time, so I, you know, I think that uh, you know more and more racism is coming, is, is uh, one of the number one points on the political platform of the Democratic and the Republican Party because people just want to talk about the Republican Party and its contract on America. But uh, the Democrats, uh, you know, the only difference between the Republicans and the Democrats right now is, is you know, they got this paternalistic uh, Clinton in the in the White House, and he, you know, gives a lukewarm pat on the head and uh, to some little modified from snatching affirmative action. But the reality is that uh, we are living in a uh, a moment that the United States government is two steps away from fascism and the, the political dialogue is not uh, between the, the, the left and the right, not between the center and the right, it's between the right wing and the far right, the ultra right. So that I believe that, uh, you know, how I feel about what is happening in, in the United States, uh, I'm afraid, you know, because, uh, you know, the, the lack of concern for human beings is one thing. But the exporting, you know, these people want to institutionalize imperialism, institutionalize their right uh, not only to oppress the people in the United States, they want to come and do it, tell people all over the world what their foreign policy is, is going to be, who they can relate to. The Helms Burton is, is nothing more, the Helms Burton bill is nothing more than the institutionalization of United States imperialism, not only against Cuba, but all over the world. And, you know, Hitler uh, had a, a, a plan that was very similar. Uh, so that a lot of what I sense from here is that uh, the United States government is resembling very closely uh, Germany in the uh, 1930s.
I wonder if you could speak a little on how important discipline is and structure is to actually making revolution in the United States. I, I do think that, that discipline is important to do anything else. And uh, we're not taught discipline. Uh, we're taught, uh, you know, do my own thing, lay it to you, I'll, you know, rush this if I feel like it, you know. Uh, it's a, a society that has as its philosophy, dog eat dog. I mean, really dog eat dog. Uh, and there is nothing progressive, there is nothing <laughs> modern about dog eat dog. And even though uh, some of us reject the uh, political positions of the United States government, that dog eat dog get mine first uh, attitude sometimes <laughs> becomes part of uh, how we act on a very unconscious level. So I think that uh, discipline is important, and I think that uh, discipline is not magic. In my own experience as a uh, political activist, um, I had to work very hard to become more and more and more and more disciplined. I'm still working on it, you yeah. uh, And I think that uh, part of being a political activist uh, has to do with changing yourself, has to do with uh, changing the way your ability to uh, do things on time, to uh, work hard, you have to work on how you deal with other people, you have to study, you know, because a lot of people think that, you know, you can make social change by being uh, ignorant. I do beg to differ, you know. <laughs> I think that you have to study a wide range of things. I think you have to work on not being dogmatic, uh, listening to other people, not talking all the time, uh, but listening. Uh, I think you have to work on um, understanding and appreciating the political positions, the cultures, etc., of people who are different than you and live in different places. And so I think that uh, social change means very much changing the person in the mirror. Okay. I wanted to ask you about the strategy that's that have been necessary for uh, uh, people to employ to um, counteract the uh, effects of the blockade, such as privatization, <laughs> enterprises, inducing enterprises. What effect do you feel these strategies will have on the process of the revolution? Um, well, I think that. Uh, there was, Cuba has no other choice except for they have to build tourism and they have to uh, have joint ventures um, with uh, corporations outside of Cuba. And um, I think that uh, tourism brings uh, some things that are in fact negative. I mean a lot of tourists come uh, with racist ideas, uh, you know, they want to uh, turn the women into prostitutes. Uh, yeah, I was in, 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 you know, I'm 50 years old. I'm at a store and a man says, how much does it cost to buy you? I said, what'd you say? <laughs> well, he, asked, he asked about some ham, right? He was asking the man, and he said, e, and, y esta mulatica? How, you know, and he was referring to me. I said, you know, that didn't go off. But I, I definitely uh, told him that I was not for sale, and, you know, he should go back uh, to his own country where his probably wife is waiting, you know. Uh, but, the, you know, uh, the uh, tourism is an industry that, you know, brings a lot of problems in the same way with uh, uh, joint uh, ventures. Often they bring their uh, racist hiring policies, etc., and they try to uh, fight against
is what the revolution is trying to create. But I think that uh, the, the leaders uh, and the revolutionary sphere are very intelligent people, and uh, they are trying to promote a tourism that is healthy, that is not based on uh, the exploitation and prostitution of women, uh, but it is, it is a struggle. It is a struggle. I think that they are doing everything to prevent uh, the foreign corporations from subverting the economy, uh, from uh, doing all kinds of counter espionage, etc., etc., etc. Again, it is a struggle, but the reality of this world is that this is a world controlled by imperialists. And so that building socialism and socialist uh, social justice in a country, uh, in a world that is controlled by imperialists is a very difficult task. And I think what it means is that uh, the revolution must be vigilant, uh, that uh, it's not just enough to uh, make sure that the educational system is intact and the healthcare system is intact but that also that people uh, must be uh, consciously prepared to struggle against all of the subtle ways that the imperialists are trying to infiltrate Cuba so that I think that ideological questions, uh, the questions of racism, gender, classism, and that people be constantly educated and constantly prepared ideologically, spiritually to resist those kinds of negative influences. Because I think one of the things that happens is that uh, the United States and all capitalist countries promote consumerism. Consumerism has become a disease in the world. You know, you have people that buy things that they have no need for whatsoever. Useless things. I mean, pet rocks. Um, you know, just insane things. You know, um, and people are more and more convinced by looking at movies and televisions that things are going to make them happy. You know, people, you know, spend hundreds of dollars to go around looking like a billboard for a sneaker factory. You know, people are so hooked on consumerism that, and they really believe that, you know, when they're sick, their sneakers are going to go walk into the kitchen and make them some soup. Or that, uh, you know, they have all this junk on and clothes and everything else, but are terribly lonely inside. Have no one to, 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 to share anything with. Have no one to enjoy with. And so I think that more and more, I don't care whether it's in Cuba, whether it's in the States, where, wherever it is, people have got to fight against that consumer mentality because it has people totally crazy. I mean, completely crazy. They, people spend money on a chain. To sit at home with the chain stuff around their neck, chain costs, I don't know how much money, walk out in the street and somebody tries to kill them for a chain, but they never have a chance to travel. They never go, can't go for a walk. To, they can't visit other places. That There's no wealth of human wealth that they're building. And I think that the real wealth that anybody on this planet can have is human wealth. And I think we have to really work with it. I don't care where you are, to you know, leave the trinkets behind and start valuing the real precious things on this earth. And that is human beings, children, the nature, 
you know, I mean, there's so much beauty on this earth that, you know, it is pitiful when you see people hung up on their silly status symbols and feel that, you know, a car can take you from point A or to point B. So why would somebody spend, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on a car that when they can spend, you know, just a, the, a limited amount of money on a car that's practical and gets them to point A or point B. And so I think that part of what has to happen is that more and more all over the world, the people have to have lifestyles and project lifestyles that are not materialistic uh, consumer uh, lifestyles. Um, I just wanted to ask, in the United States, I think um, us as black people, we have a lot of different movements that we're working on, and um, we have just a lot of different goals, and it's hard for us sometimes to come together and really focus on one thing in terms of where we think we need to go, if we need to stay there, if we need to leave, um, just a whole lot of different things. Do you think there's something consistent that should go throughout all our movements that can, um, can I guess, find us? more so that we aren't vulnerable to people trying to separate us because of our differences. Do you think there are things that we should use to connect ourselves all the time? Um, I think first of all, unity. You know, you have to have the seeds of unity within you. Unity is not something external that, you know, shines down from the sky. Unity is, some, is something that we have to feel inside and practice in, in a whole lot of ways. How we work with people, how we treat people, etc. Uh, unity is not however, uniformity. And while we should work for unity, I think we should avoid uniformity. Uh, I think we, uh, the things that can unite us is uh, a struggle for social justice where people, everybody, should have as a right health care. Everybody should have as a right education. Everybody has should have as a right being free from repression, being free from police brutality. Uh, I think that uh, imperialism and the struggle against imperialism is very important for anybody who is trying to uh, uh, build and work for and struggle for social change. Uh, I, I think that the struggle against uh, racism, against uh, sexism, against um, um, homophobia, and uh, against class oppression. Can those are some of the things that I think that we can uh, unite around? We don't have to all have the same vision of freedom, but I think we have to respect each other's uh, positions and look for ways where we can work together uh, because uh, there is not one truth. There are, are many truths on this planet. Uh, there is not one way of being liberated on this planet. There are many ways. And uh, my, way, my vision of liberation may be very different from someone who is in the Navajo Nation's vision, but we have an equal right to fight for our visions and to respect each other. Thank you. Okay, my question is, in uh, Cuba's times of hard economy, uh, you would think that it would be right for a black market? And just in your opinion, how do you think Cuba has resisted the U.S.-sponsored drug sabotage in the communities? Um, well, I think that, um, well, first of all, I call, I, call, I, I call the black market clandestine market because I, you know, I think that one of the things we all do is black market. For a while, there was a, a, a clandestine market, but it had not to do with drugs or anything. It had to do with uh, people uh, selling things illegally, you know, that were uh, bought. Uh, this was before people had to have dollars. And so people would buy things uh, from the stores and then sell it. Uh, 
people at high cost. But now everybody can go into the dollar stores and have dollars, so that has been eliminated. Uh, I think that uh, the way that Cuba fights against drugs uh, is to seriously take a position a against drugs. Uh, to have a policy that is seriously against drugs because in the United States you don't have a policy against drugs. You have a hypocritical sham law and order uh, performance by the same people who are pushing a drug mentality in, this, in the United States and by the same people who are pushing drugs. The U.S. government is pushing drugs. The police departments are pushing drugs. When I was in prison, you know, I, sisters will walk up to me, yeah, I sold drugs for Sergeant A. I sold drugs for Sergeant so-and-so. You know, the police on every level in the United States are involved in the selling of drugs. The drug uh, enforcement uh, agency is involved in the selling of drugs. The CIA is famous for selling drugs and promoting drugs uh, being filtered into the United States. So what you have uh, is a situation where People, rich people in the United States are profiting from drugs and they buy stock in drugs just like they buy stock in IT&T, AT&T, uh, IBM, whatever. And you have a, a, a whole industry that is drug oriented. For example, uh, what was the dude's name, Dole? <laughs> now, Dole and Bush, etc., ran off at the mouth talking about law and order, lock up drug people, uh, you know, more police, etc., etc. But they have stock in companies that sell methadone. They talk about drugs on one hand, but embrace policies that make uh, tobacco, for example. Now, you had Dole. Now, this man wanted to be the president of the United States, so I mean, he had some morals. <coughs> Talking about how cigarette smoke is non-addictive. In 1996, the man came out and said, cigarette smoke is not addictive. What kind of a message is that? What kind of hypocrisy? I mean, it was, I mean, he was just a harlot, received so much money from the tobacco industry that he was willing to tell young people all over the country that cigarette smoke is not addictive to some people. You know, I mean, it's a clever game. They're nothing but hypocrites. And I don't care where, whether they're in the Congress, the White House, etc. It is a total policy not to end the drugs, but to promote a drug war in the United States. So that, that poor people will kill each other, using drugs, selling drugs, and, and fighting over drug territory. So don't get confused about, you know, uh, uh, the United States. No, I was thinking mm -hmm. they even drop the drugs here, and I'm wondering They try. Oh, they try, but Cuba does not play. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Cuba does not play. And that's why you have young people here that look healthy, are healthy, you know, and have a future. They offer, you know, because people take drugs because they are in so much pain that they can't deal with the reality because they don't feel like they have a future. In Cuba, young people feel like they have a future, they are not in pain, and they feel like they have power over their own existence. And so that is the basic difference between uh, what happens uh, in Cuba and what happens in the United States.
question. Oh, 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 that's a question. Pointing us to I oh, I take the question. No, we don't have a question. <laughs> so my question is, I want to know how do the personal relationships between men and women change under socialism? <laughs> There that supported the liberation of women and women being able to work, etc. Uh, they have the Family Code, which is uh, a document that when you get married in Cuba, you have to sign the Family Code, and it says, you know, that men and women will share with the uh, raising of the children, will share with the housework, that, you know, they will divide that equally. <laughs> uh, there are, you know, men in Cuba, they sign that paper, and that's the last time they think about, you know, the family code. Uh, I think the, the Federation of Women works hard to change people's consciousness. I think that uh, the women are, you know, struggle to, to, to uh, fight against machismo, but there is a long way to go. And, and as I said, you know, a revolution, unfortunately, is not a magic wand. Because if I had a magic wand to fight against sexism, I played that thing all day long. <laughs> Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, the fight has been very serious and very consistent against uh, sexism, but uh, there's a way to go. <laughs> okay. I have a June copy of the Essence magazine, and there was a question in there about how do you deal with you, the U.S. government saying that you are a threat to society. It doesn't really say how you feel, but can you tell me how you feel about it? How I feel about them saying the U.S. government saying that you are a threat to society. Is it good or bad? Um, well, um, you know, at first, uh, I, I was, when I was young, I'm talking about when I was very uh, young, and, you know, they first uh, started to, you know, leak all these, these articles to the press, and they called me all kinds of things. I mean, at first that really got to me. It really, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't just angry, I was really hurt, you know, because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, to have a government that, you know, just shoot your people, you know, there were water hoses, dogs, you know, what we went through in the 60s where, you know, I mean, you go to a demonstration and I would just, you know, stand there, you know, waiting. Uh, and they would come at us with those sticks, I mean, and those helmets, swinging. And then this government is going to call me a terrorist. You know, this government that's in Vietnam, that uh, it was in uh, Panama, that's dropping napalm, gonna call me a terrorist. I, it hurt my feelings, you know, but then <laughs> I got used to it, you know, because, you know, it seemed like everybody else that they don't like, they call terrorists too, you know, so I just start to feel well, you know. Uh, if 
that the government uh, suddenly started to say nice things about me, I would have to start to go back in my 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 little woodshed and think, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> so I'm pretty used to it by now. Is there some ways in which the United States government has been trying to sabotage your life in Cuba? Well, let's put it this way, they haven't helped it very much. Uh, they have asked for um, me, my extradition. Um, they have um, uh, threatened to come here and kidnap me. Uh, the United States has not recognized any country's borders, so uh, Presidential Act something, something, something says the United States has the right to go into any country and kidnap anybody if they want. Uh, so they, you know, publicly threatened to do that. Um, and then, you know, on the Helms Burton Act, you know, one of the, their, uh, the parts of the Helms Burton Act is the so-called list of 90, 90 people that are fugitives, so-called, from the United States so-called justice. Well, I'll tell you for one thing, I've been living in Cuba for a while. I would like to find some of these people, these 90 people, because I don't believe that they exist anywhere but on the list. Because uh, if anybody knows about most of these 90 people, please let me know. I could use some hangout partners this weekend. <laughs> You know, the return of these uh, 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 90 uh, people should uh, be uh, a, uh, what do you call it, uh, should be a, a condition for normalizing relations between the U.S. and Cuba. So uh, the United States government has not just accelerated its uh, repressive policies against Cuba. It is also, you know, uh, doing the same thing to me. So, I mean, you know. Do you have any special words for young women of color, you know, sister to sister, that those of us who work with them can bring back to them in the United States? Um, yes, I, I think, uh, oh well, hi sister, that's first day. <laughs> Sisters, uh, first of all, need to be very conscious people. We need to be conscious on all levels. We need to have a gender consciousness. We need to have a political consciousness. We need to be conscious about racism. And we need to have confidence in ourselves and in our ability uh, not only to be part of the movement, but to assume leadership uh, positions in the movement. Um, I think that it is important not only for uh, sisters to uh, be like, uh, or to continue a male-oriented style of leadership and political activity. I think more and more sisters have to be at the forefront of creating a new political style, a new political culture that um, gets rid of the kind of macho, uh, talking head uh, style that was very prevalent in the 1960s where uh, people just assumed that the leader was he. Uh, that leadership style often had to do with a lot of macho egoism. It had to do with a lot of uh, contradictions where uh, someone would uh, men I'm talking about, would uh, talk about freedom and liberation and everything else 
on, on a podium and then go home. And in their own homes, they would be the oppressor, you know, they would talk about socialism uh, in, on the podium and get home and be the bourgeoisie. So I think <laughs> that uh, it is very important for sisters to be involved in changing uh, the style and the content of politics in uh, the 90s and on. <laughs> what do you think is the importance of the conference? Um, what two things? One is that there's so many Americans that come, and the other that this one is in Cuba. I think this, this conference, or oh, this festival, because it's much more than a festival. I mean, you know, people are doing more than, than just talking and just uh, interchanging ideas. People are hanging out and visiting and sharing. Um, so I, I think that uh, this, in a very real sense, is very much a festival. Um, I think it's very important because I think it shows that people in the United States are not as brainwashed as we've been uh, taught to think. Uh, I think that uh, more and more uh, young people and people of all ages are saying, well, wait a minute, we, have, we should have the right to travel anywhere we want to travel. Uh, we should have the right to see for ourselves what Cuba is like. Uh, and so I think that it's very important, uh, this festival, uh, not only showing uh, that people uh, feel differently about Cuba than the government feels about Cuba, but also that the presence of so many people in, uh, from the United States indicates that there are a whole lot of young people that are just disgusted with the politics, the policies, the big stick repressive policies of the United States government and really are not afraid. And I want to ask, y'all been asking me a lot of questions. I have a question for y'all. <laughs> now, you know, in the, when, when the 1990s rolled in, you know, I started to feel really depressed. You know, the socialist camp was falling. Uh, you know, there was, you know, every time I would talk to people, people would say, oh, how terrible things are in this state, how little activity, etc. And I realized that, you know, this century, the 20th century has been one century more of slavery, one century more of colonialism and neo-colonialism and human pain and oppression. And I said to myself, okay, y'all got this century. Now I'm asking y'all, who does the next century belong to? Does it belong to those who oppress and exploit, or does it belong to you, the young people? Who does it belong to? Who does it belong to? Can you do it? Can we win? I can do it. We have at least one more question, and then uh, <laughs> if there aren't any more, I promise one more and a couple of announcements before we go. Um, when you were a young woman first entering the struggle, who were some of the people, particularly black women or women of color, who influenced you? Even if we don't know them, like were they women in your community, your mother? Your you want to repeat the question? Who were some of the people, particularly women of color, who influenced her when she was a young woman first getting into the struggle? Well, my first example 
were my grandmother, my mother, my aunt, uh, then I, I, you know, I, in school, I remember the third grade, they talked about slavery. And you know, they talked about the slaves, like, you know, they just found these apes in Africa and out of the kindness of their good heart, brought us here to, to, say, to introduce us to, to Christianity and everything. And I would slide under the desk, you know, every time they would mention slavery until I found about, out, out about Harriet Tubman. So she was one of my first historical uh, um, figures that, that was uh, a role model. Uh, and then as time went by, you know, I, I learned about many others, Sojourner Truth, and uh, just so many uh, sisters that fought. And then it became international. I learned about Nanny in Jamaica, Ya, Asantua in Ghana. I learned about so many sisters all over the world who have stood up strong and proud against <coughs> slavery, against <coughs> oppression. Uh, in the civil rights struggle, there were so many sisters in the Black Panther Party and in uh, the movement in general, there were many sisters that I, I loved and respected. And so, uh, understanding that women have been very crucial to our struggle and that it was crucial to me as a human being because I tell you, you know, I started out uh, as a very shy, timid, fragile person. And I think that what has enabled me to be able to grow, to be able to have confidence in myself, to be able to develop, has been the love, the support, uh, and the wisdom of my sisters. So I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. After we say thank you to Asada, uh, I want to ask you to sit down and take a moment for at least one or two announcements that are important. So what are we going to say to Asada? Thank you. Thank you. Well, now that you have thanked me, let me thank you. Let me thank you for your courage, for your example, for your beauty, and for your commitment. And let me thank you also for not only inspiring me, but for giving me the, the, the chance to hang out with so many beautiful people. And, and I kind of wanted to conclude this to talk about young people in Cuba and the hip hop community. At the, at the hip hop festival, one of the last things they did on the final day is they invited Sister Asada Shakur and Sister Nahanda Abiodun, another political exile, onto the stage. And they paid tribute, the rappers in Cuba paid tribute to them by singing a song that they had called, I Want to Be a Nigga Like Malcolm. And I thought that it was very interesting that this was a popular song about Malcolm X in Cuba when we really didn't have any songs from our community where hip hop was founded on Malcolm X. He's mentioned in songs and names thrown out here and there, but this was an entire hit single specifically dealing with wanting to be like Malcolm X, and it was overwhelming. People want to get involved in the Hands Off Asada campaign also, please give me um, names and numbers. I actually apologize for being late. I rushed up from a meeting, uh, one of our first organizing meetings at Mega Evers College, uh, specifically geared towards raising awareness and support for our sister and to counter the propaganda being put out um, by the New Jersey um, government officials. And that it's very important that we do this because it's not enough to talk about Cuba, to talk about Asada, to talk about lifting the embargo. We have to put in the same kind of work that Asada put in to making sure that we live the better life that she grew up in. And I think that the responsibility is now on us 
it, not just to benefit from all of her hard work and struggle and, and of the hard work and struggle of brothers and sisters like her, but to also do that work and live like Malcolm, as the youth in Cuba say. Thank you. I'm not so sure I could tell you who kills Aid or who killed a trooper. I know I have a deep regret for the loss of Zaid, whom I knew many, many years ago, who was part of the Panther 21 trial in 1968, and when I was happy to have been a, a witness, a character witness, for Joan Bird, who was one of my students at Resurrection Parish School in Harlem, a Faney, who at that time was pregnant with Tupac, and in fact, uh, the FBI threatened, as if I had given a damn, that when we did the funeral for Zaid at Marcus Jackson Funeral Home up there on, at that time, 8th Avenue, but Frederick Douglass Boulevard, that uh, they were going to report me to believe this now, I'm a grown man, they were going to report me to Cardinal Spellman, and at which point I had one of the great belly laughs that I've had in a long time. Uh, be that as it may, I think it's rather the evidence, what is there, uh, it's rather clear that Zaid was assassinated, and probably the trooper was a victim of, don't laugh, friendly fire, and that they did not want that told because his death was going to be quite convenient in order to bring a charge against Asada Shakur because the, in spite of the New Jersey law, that it seems to me that they would have had a more difficult time pinning the death of Zaid on Asada if he were the only one. And so knowing the devil being what it was, I wasn't surprised if what happened is that they let the trooper die deliberately in order to have a better case against Asada. That has been my uh, theory from uh, some time back. The final thing of hypocrisy was when he spoke about political prisoners. Now, if the Pope really wanted to deal with political prisoners in an objective way, he would, before turning to Castro, he would have turned to Bill Clinton and talk about political prisoners and talk about the hypocrisy of criminalizing. Now, I know uh, Grandpa doesn't like to use the term political prisoners. I use it simply because I use both. They are prisoners precisely because they're freedom fighters. You see, and that's why they are prisoners today. This country has a diabolical hypocrisy of criminalizing freedom fighters, and so they could say, we have none who are in jail because of their belief and their activities against an oppressive regime, but because they have committed crime. And if you cannot find a crime, then you make one up, like in the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal, Eddie Ellis sitting here, Geronimo Pratt, and, and you name them, the, the thing goes on and on. But I thought it was also very interesting, the hypocrisy, a allegedly Catholic, and I say allegedly because most of those who claim they're Catholics or Christians or anything else haven't a clue what it is, and you can tell that by their behavior. But this uh, lieutenant in the New Jersey State Police, I, I have other terminology, wrote a letter which I know got to the Pope asking the Pope to intercede with Fidel in order to have Asada extradited back to the United States to be brought to justice. Now every time I hear this criminal, just, uh, criminal system of injustice refer to someone being brought to justice, you always ask who's going to take them to the moon? Because if you think that the American judiciary has a damn thing to do with justice, well then it means that you're just born. But they use that phrase and folks fall for the okie doke I, I knew about the letter. I was, and I knew he got it. I was delighted to hear the tape of Asada in response. I, I'm still waiting for it because I want to make sure it gets in the hands of the Pope because I thought it was a magnificent thing. I'm sure all of you by now have heard Asada on tape in response 
to, and of course, Christopher or, Christ, or Christine, depending on how you look at it, Whitman, who is the governor, is now being used as the hatchet person in order to uh, do this. But it's certainly being financed a great deal by the fascist order of pigs called the Fraternal Order of Police who are the mainstream behind trying to uh, get Mumia Abdul-Jamal executed. But I would like to get, because I know O'Connor uh, would not make, uh, send that uh, tape to the Pope, when somebody could be more concerned about playing baseball on Good Friday, as if Jesus give a damn about that, but closing his eyes and haven't heard a word about the attempt to kill people by the closing down of hospitals, which cures simply because the SOB in City Hall is his buddy. Well, then I have to say, anybody with those kinds of priorities, or whose priorities are so concerned about me while I'm inside the womb, and I'm glad for that, but don't give a damn when I come out, and that's why he could speak to a holy name police society and talk about we should be careful about talking about police brutality when 95% of the killer cops who have killed us in the last 20 years claim to be Roman Catholics when he doesn't seem to give a damn about political economic decisions that are being made from uh, pants up Clinton with the so-called Nat and Gat and now age 14, 32 and the so-called welfare reform, which is simply a newer and more diabolical form of slavery, when he doesn't care about the alleged Pataki and Giuliani, who are allegedly Catholics and the most gun ho on the death penalty, which is condemned equally by Catholic teaching as well as killing inside the womb, then I have no confidence that O'Connor is going to send Asada Shakur's tape to the Pope. I was trying to get my hand on it. I've been promised by two people, but I still haven't. But I'm sure that I will, and it will get to him. Because this is the kind of thing we have to let the Pope, maybe late, but come to the realization of what this country is all about. As I am primarily here, as a result of hundreds, if not thousands, of people who supported my release, many of whom are probably sitting in the audience. And had it not been for that response and that pressure put on the government, I probably would still be in prison with so many other political prisoners who cannot get release. And the major reason they cannot get release is because I think we have failed to bring the weight of our collective and righteous indignation to the notice of the government. And we can't do it by talk. We must do that by action. And only through our actions collectively will we be able to send a message that we honor and respect who are in prison for political activity. We call them freedom fighters or political prisoners or captured activists. But we must let them, as Al points out, we must let them know that they are not forgotten and that they live in our hearts because they gave their lives and dedicated themselves to our struggle. And if we think that we're in bad shape now, imagine what worse shape we would probably be in had it not been for people like Asata Shakur and people like Daruba Ben Wahad and the hundreds of other political prisoners who exist in this country. And when I was asked to speak here tonight, I thought about Asata and why Asata and why now and what are some of the lessons that we may be able to learn as a result of these most unfortunate circumstances. Asata Shakur is in fact as are we all slaves in this country 
economic slaves, wage slaves. But more than anything else, the system of slavery exists in the prisons. And as many of you know, the 13th Amendment of, to the United States Constitution prohibits slavery except in cases in which people are duly convicted of so-called criminal activity. And it just seems to me that to be a person in struggle is criminal activity. In America, if you're poor, you're a criminal. If you're Latino and live in the inner city, you're a criminal. And God knows what else they call young black men and women. It's a crime to be black in America. It's a crime to speak out in America, notwithstanding the First Amendment. But more importantly, Asata Shakur represents the finest revolutionary struggle. She represents the height of freedom fighters. She's the example of the best that we have as a political activist. And she's a black woman. And she is the epitome of what it means to struggle against oppression and injustice. And so understanding that we understand why it is that all of these forces are arrayed against her and why there is this demand to bring her back to this God-forsaken place. Father Lucas talked about the criminalization of freedom fighters. And very simply that is that the government of the United States of America has always taken people who have been involved in struggle and has used the criminal justice, criminal injustice system as a way in which to keep them in line to discipline them and ultimately to punish them when they digress from the party line. And led by people like Asata Shakur, there have been so many digressions from the party line that the prisons in this country are full of men and women who dare to struggle, who dare to raise their voices and say no, who dare to fight back, who represent us, even in times when we fail to represent ourselves. Asata Shakur is the best and the brightest among us. And as long as she lives, she is a testimony to the legacy of struggle that has been born in this country in the African resistance movement. 